U.S. microchip maker Intel is lobbying lawmakers. That's over a new bill that could spell trouble for the company if it keeps its operations in China. The European Union's incoming ambassador to China says the EU supports China's peaceful reunification with Taiwan. At the same time, the former U.S. defense secretary is calling for an end to the One China policy. A new move from Russia could boost its ties with like-minded countries. And China is on the list. And Chinese companies are buying up U.S. land. But those purchases come with risks. Cleo Pascal with the Foundation for Defensive Democracies breaks it down. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. U.S. microchip maker Intel is trying to keep its operations in China. That's as the Senate voted to move ahead with a semiconductor subsidy bill. It's part of efforts to counter China's weapons and technology development. Under the bill, companies have to follow certain rules in order to get benefits. One of them to keep factory operations out of China. Let's take a closer look. The bill got bipartisan support in the Senate in a procedural vote on Tuesday. The yeas nearly doubled the nays. That support paves the way for the measure, which the House and Senate will formally vote on later next week. The bill has been dubbed the CHIPS Act. If passed, it would provide $54 billion in subsidies and about $24 billion in tax credits for U.S. semiconductor companies that set up manufacturing on American soil. The specifics of the bill still have to be set, but they could attach preconditions to the billions in benefits, like not building advanced semiconductor facilities in China. Intel previously ran a chip manufacturing factory in northeast China. It was sold to another company years ago. In 2020, Intel invested in two Chinese startups in the semiconductor sector. That decision came amid tensions between Washington and Beijing over microchip manufacturing. And last year, the Biden administration reportedly blocked an Intel expansion plan in China. Intel has been operating in China for more than 30 years. It's now one of the biggest foreign investors inside China. The company's business ties to China might be a factor slowing down development in the U.S. Intel said in January it would spend $20 billion to build a new factory in Ohio. That figure could grow to $100 billion. But without subsidies from the U.S. government, the project might not come to fruition as fast as planned. Intel and several other American chip makers are reportedly lobbying lawmakers to loosen the restrictions imposed by the chips bill. Most of the world's most advanced chips are made in Asia. Only 12 percent are crafted in the U.S. That's down from the nearly 40 percent made in America in the 1990s. China's military released a new statement this week denouncing U.S. action in the Indo-Pacific. It calls the U.S. a maker of security risks and a destroyer of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. The remark came out on Wednesday after a U.S. warship sailed through the sensitive waterway a day before. A month ago, China's foreign ministry claimed that the Taiwan Strait is not part of international waters and that China has sovereignty over it. This week's sail is thought to be the first time a U.S. warship journeyed through the Taiwan Strait since China's claim. The Taiwan Strait is the gateway for travel between nearly all major seaports in Northeast Asia. According to the U.S. Navy's 7th Fleet, a destroyer called the USS Binfold conducted a routine mission through international waters in the Taiwan Strait in accordance with international law. The U.S. Navy has been carrying out these voyages for almost every month, but the missions anger Beijing, which views them as a sign of support for Taiwan. The Chinese communist regime regards the self-ruled island as part of its territory, though it has never ruled Taiwan. The Chinese military claims to have followed the U.S. ship throughout its journey and, quote, warned it, saying Chinese forces remain on high alert at all times. The U.S. Navy said the ship's transit through the Taiwan Strait demonstrates the United States' commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Taiwan's defense ministry said the situation in the waterway was as normal. The Benfold has been operating in the disputed South China Sea. It has carried out two freedom of navigation operations in the past week there. 
A former defense secretary is calling on the Biden administration to make its stance clear whether it would come to Taiwan's defense should Beijing launch an invasion. Here's more. Former U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper is calling on Washington to reevaluate its one China policy. He says it's now useless. The one China policy has outlived its usefulness. That it is time to move away from strategic ambiguity. I think it's important that we begin that national discussion back in the United States. During the Chinese Civil War, Taiwan's current government fled from mainland China, where the Chinese Communist Party later took power. Despite that, Beijing sees Taiwan as part of its territory, even though the communist regime never ruled the island. Beijing has also threatened to take Taiwan by force. The U.S. doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but Washington is required by law to provide the island with the means to defend itself. The U.S. also maintains a strategy called strategic ambiguity. It means Washington does not make clear whether it would come to Taiwan's defense in the case of a Chinese invasion. But calls to change that stance have grown as the Chinese regime ramps up its military development and persists in its threat to take Taiwan by force. Esper points to the urgency. The greatest challenge facing the democracies of the West today is not in Russia. It is here in Asia, where China continues to challenge the rule-based international order. Taiwan is on the front lines. It is important that the democracies of the West stand up and defend thriving democracies such as Taiwan against the bullying. In response, Taiwan's president thanked Esper for his support. The strength of alliances between democratic partners must be strengthened to work together to defend peace and the values of democratic freedom. Back in Washington, the U.S. Senate Foreign Affairs Committee is expected to review a bill in August. Called the Taiwan Policy Act, the bipartisan bill aims to revamp Washington's Taiwan policy. Sponsors include Senator Bob Menendez, a Democrat, and Senator Lindsey Graham, a Republican. Both say the bill would push the most comprehensive restructuring of U.S. policy toward Taiwan in over four decades. If passed, the rule would require the president to slap sanctions on Chinese officials and the head of the Communist Party in the case that Beijing invades Taiwan. It would also provide Taiwan with $4.5 billion in military assistance over the next four years. A top European official met with Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen on Wednesday. Nicola Beer is one of the European Parliament's vice presidents. She called for China to open a mutual and respectful dialogue with self-governing Taiwan. She emphasized Taiwan's importance on a global scale, calling for the World Health Assembly to allow Taiwan's participation and for the European Union to upgrade its representation in Taipei. She reaffirmed Taiwan has the right to determine its own future. Only the Taiwanese people can decide on Taiwanese future. We call on the Public Republic of China to refrain from its threatening gestures. We admonish China not to destroy Taiwan's blossoming, but to take an active and constructive part in maintaining and securing the current status quo based on mutual and respectful dialogue. Tsai hailed the growing economic relations between Taiwan and the EU and showed appreciation for the EU's increasing focus on Taiwan-related issues in the past few years. Beijing cut off all contact with Taipei after Tsai's initial 2016 election, when she refused to recognize that Taiwan is a part of China. On Tuesday, Beijing condemned Beer's Taiwan visit and the European Parliament's adoption of pro-Taiwan resolutions. The European Union says it supports peace and the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. This after its incoming ambassador to China said the EU supports China's peaceful reunification of Taiwan. The new ambassador, Jorge Toledo Albiniana, gave a speech earlier this month. In it, he said the EU is not defending Taiwan independence, but peaceful reunification. The term peaceful reunification stems from the Chinese Communist Party. It refers to a situation where mainland China takes over Taiwan without a war. He added, if China invades Taiwan, Europe, together with the U.S. and its allies, will introduce the same or even more serious measures than those they have taken against Russia following its invasion of Ukraine. The ambassador has made the EU stance to China clear. That is, the EU considers China a partner. 
In other remarks, he said that without China's help, the world will not be able to cope with global challenges like the pandemic and the climate crisis, adding that China is an important partner in dealing with Iran on nuclear weapons. As for trade, he emphasized the EU and China are the most important trading partners in the world. To back up his statement, he cited China's status as the second largest economy in the world and as the country with the most purchasing power. Albaniana will take up his new position in September in Beijing, representing the 27 countries of the EU. Russian President Vladimir Putin met with his counterparts from Iran and Turkey on Tuesday. Their meeting comes as Moscow looks to forge closer strategic ties with countries that share certain interests. Other nations on that list include China and India. Here are the details. In his first trip outside the former Soviet Union since Moscow's February 24th invasion of Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin on Tuesday had talks with Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei in Iran. He also had a face-to-face -face meeting with Turkey's Tayyip Erdogan in Tehran to discuss Ukraine's Black Sea grain exports and the conflict in northern Syria. Putin's trip comes just days after U.S. President Joe Biden visited Israel and Saudi Arabia, sending a strong message to the West about Moscow's plans to forge closer strategic ties with Iran, China and India in the face of Western sanctions. In another meeting, Putin, Erdogan and Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi weighed efforts to reduce violence in Syria. Speaking at the end of those talks, Putin said the three presidents were committed to efforts to normalize the situation there after a decade of conflict. We agreed with our Iranian and Turkish colleagues to continue the practice of holding regular international expert consultations on Syria under the auspices of the Astana format. Along with the delegations of our three countries, Syrian parties take part in these consultations. The government and the opposition, the observer states, Jordan, Iraq and Lebanon, as well as the UN representatives. Putin, who turns 70 this year, has made few foreign trips in recent years due to the COVID-19 pandemic and then the Ukraine crisis. His last trip beyond the former Soviet Union was to China in February. Turkey is a member of NATO, the world's largest military alliance. It joins nations from North America and Europe and is led by the U.S. The meeting marked Putin's first in-person talks with a leader of a NATO member country since Russian troops invaded Ukraine in February. Chinese companies have been buying up U.S. land. To analyze the risks tied to the purchases, Cleo Pascal with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies joined Steve Lance of NTD's Capital Report. Here's what she had to say. Cleo Pascal, thank you so much for joining us in the Capital Report. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Cleo, companies uh, linked to the Chinese Communist Party have been buying up U.S. real estate and land. Uh, now there's cause for concern about China purchasing U.S. agriculture, most recently a large purchase in North uh, Dakota. Uh, is there any cause for concern here? Yes, M multiple causes for concern. So there's, first of all, there's the fact that it's agricultural land. Uh, and we know that China has a, a sensitivity, let's say, to, uh, to food supply. Uh, which means that they're perfectly happy to debilitate American food supply if it uh, enhances Chinese food supply. And the other is, of course, the location, uh, which is uh, near a base. This is something we've been tracking for for very, very long time. I remember I was in the Kingdom of Tonga and I saw um, a Chinese clinic opposite the entry to the barracks of the uh, Tongan Defense Forces and uh, talked to some Tongan colleagues about it. And they said, Oh, yeah. And we think that the woman that runs this clinic is PLA, and she set herself up right opposite the entrance to the barracks so that Tongan military, when they get a sore shoulder or whatever, go over to her clinic for treatment and a bit of a chat. Uh, they don't realize what they're doing, but she certainly does. So we know that this is part of a very entrenched pattern um, of locating uh, what seem like commercial inst installations near pieces of critical infrastructure or militarily sensitive in installations in other countries. Cleo, in the early 2000s, the CCP was busy buying up rare earth minerals in Africa while the U.S. was distracted, uh, fighting multiple wars. What can these types of comprehensive power policies, as you've called them, uh, lead to? 
Yeah, so this is actually China's policy of uh, comprehensive national power is overt. This is in the Chinese think tanks. China ranks countries around the world in terms of relative comprehensive national power. It's an empirical metric. And uh, an incredible range of different factors go into it, things that we wouldn't consider parts of power, like, for example, agricultural resources. They have military, economic, intellectual property, but all of these other things as well. So in that sense, um, feeding all of these things into the Chinese system or a system that China can control increases China's comprehensive national power and decreases the comprehensive national power of the target countries. So this is very much consistent with the driving force behind a lot of their foreign policy decisions. Now, the FBI director just called China the biggest threat uh, facing the West, warning about stealing technology. Uh, does the threat, it sounds like it obviously does, go beyond uh, the theft of intellectual property? And what is your take on the FBI director's warning? Uh, it was great to hear it, and it was good to hear uh, the, the UK MI5 director uh, reiterating it as well. It's something that everybody knows. If you talk to the people in North Dakota, they're very concerned about this farmland purchase as well. Uh, we, we know this on the ground. If you're anywhere near any of these Chinese installations or commerces, or if your uh, community has been destroyed by fentanyl or anything like that, you know what China's comprehensive national power push looks like, how it, uh, it's parasitic, it sucks everything good out, all capital, intellectual property, research, brings it back to China and leaves behind it a devastating trail of destroyed communities, families, and countries. Cleo Pascal, thank you so much. Thank you. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Protests have erupted in China as citizens call on banks to return their frozen deposits. Experts say the regime may see the social unrest as a threat to its rule. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Appbok TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. Presenting the heritage of traditional Chinese martial arts, promoting martial ethics, and reviving the true tradition. The 2022 NTD International Traditional Chinese Martial Arts Competition Preliminaries will be held in New York and Taiwan. On August 28th, the finals will be broadcast live online worldwide. Registration hotline 188-477-9228. For more information, please visit martialarts.ntdtv.com.